So in this little session, we'll look at some methods to, to calm ourselves down. There'll be just a little bit of theory, which you can basically read here. It's about the nervous system. The most important thing to know about yourself in terms of, of, of stress, but also how to master stress or how to deal with it, how to calm yourself down when you're experiencing it is the autonomic nervous system, the control system of your brain that, that you cannot really control. Some people think that you can control it, like Wim Hof and other people doing uh, breathing exercises and so on. And I'm sure certain parts of it can somehow be taken control of also through yogic techniques, but um, generally it's completely out of control. And we want it that way because it takes care of our digestion and what it's really about uh, deeply is energy distribution. So the body wants to, as a system, we need energy available for the right use at the right time. So uh, for, for digestion, there's a certain system and it's called the parasympathetic nervous system in green throughout the whole document. And, and for movement, for, and that's where the stress response come in. If you feel a lot of stress, typically it's because your body is activating you to solve a physical problem, running away or whatever, uh, or fighting. So that that's the fight or flight response, as you can see here. Um, and one thing that's nice to know is that um, the best way of of decreasing your sympathetic response, your stress response in the prison moment is not to battle it or fight it. Um, it's hard, like what I'm talking about here, if you just tell yourself to calm down and sometimes even certain things like deep sighing or can, can be counterproductive um, by tackling the, the stress response head on by trying to reduce it that can lead to these circular feedback loops instead of actually calming down. And what to do instead is to focus uh, on the parasympathetic nervous system because they work uh, antagonistically, which means that when one turns on, the other turns off. So they go like this together. Um, and because they go like this, instead of trying to, to take your stress down, all you have to do is take your, your calmness up and it will pull the stress down automatically, kind of. With that being said, it's still nice to know what stress feels like because we can only start working with our problems when we get an awareness of it. So... Um, it does make sense as a, as a kind of a beginning strategy to get to learn what it feels like to be stressed, to actually just increase it in a way. Uh, and so it's, it can be fun to actually configure your body in the way that when you feel stressed. So as you're watching this, you might wanna just try and, and do whatever it means to you to feel stressed, or you can think of some situation that was associated with stress um, and notice what kind of happens in in your body if you allow your body to kind of embody that memory maybe your breath maybe your shoulders maybe your whole body posture notice what it is that happens And this will be unique to everybody who does this exercise. It also depends on what situation you thought of. And if you have any, now you might want to try and turn that off again. So you went into it, you followed the tendency, but can you now let go of that and simply wash it away again? Mm so while I do think that, you know, what we want to do is calm down, not focusing on, on removing the stress, like I just said before, 
but still, this is still a, a valid strategy sometimes to actually follow the tendency to, to know what it is, to even exaggerate your stressed body language and then to turn it off. So you might oscillate like between feeling that tension and then taking it away again. Placing your head in that kind of <laughs> forward position <laughs> and then bringing it back, ah, taking a wider perspective, for example. So we want to know what we're dealing with. And again, it will be unique to everybody. Yeah. So I think yeah, now there's some, some, uh, some simple things that you can work with. And um, yeah, I don't really know how these, there's many techniques out there. So this is just a selection. One of my favorite ones um, is breathe, orient, and reach. And really it's the first two that are, are, are essential here. And um, so it's, it's th three steps. So we can just try and go through it and we can talk about why it makes sense. So the first one is, if you're stressed, to notice your breath. So how does that work for you right now to notice your breath? As you watch this, as your eyes perhaps look on the screen or you can close your eyes, what helps you to notice your breath? I mean, I could also put my hand on my tummy, for example. To yeah, do that. Yeah, that's a good idea. So kinesthetic awareness. That's a great idea. Um, noticing our breath can be very abstract because it actually demands our interoception to, to do a lot of work. That is the sensing inside, but our exterosension, exteroception, our sensing outside, for example, our hands, our touch can be so much clearer, so much more concrete. Now the second uh, thing is to orient yourself and that it can seem a bit <clears throat> uh, not forced, but a bit artificial, but try and follow along anyway. You simply want to look around your environment where you are and see where you are. First of all, okay, this is where I am. Second of all, is this a safe place? So as I look over my shoulder, as I maybe look under my desk, ah, I see there's no threats here. There's just this pretty safe place, I would say. <clears throat> and this might seem silly if you're feeling calm as you watch this, it might seem like, oh, okay, whatever. Um, but for, for some people, if you're in a serious, uh, seriously stressful state, this tends to lock your world in to a very small place uh, and the breathing will be locked and there, there can be great value in this. Simply noticing the breath, looking around. And lastly, building on the last two, and this is more like an option. We've done this in the reaching video uh, or in the, the balance and reaching exercises is to simply, it's basically an expression of our, our capacity to choose. So as I orient myself, you can just imagine that you wanna reach towards that thing. Exercising your ability to reach into the world in this fundamental sense that you're, you're not a victim, but that you can affect the world. That you're not disempowered, but that you can that you can act upon the world through just a simple gesture through space, looking somewhere and reaching, picking up an object perhaps. And just do this very mindfully, we can do a couple more. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So, so these three uh, techniques, they, they kind of resituate us in ourselves. The little green text I put in, the first one, notice that I'm, I'm breathing. Okay, I'm actually alive right now. Second one, scanning your environment for, for dangers and threats and just seeing where you are is a way to, to re-emphasize I'm safe. I'm alive. That, for example, would be tricky in a, let's say, in an action situation where you actually don't feel safe in a space because yeah. there, I don't know, is police confrontation, for example, or whatever else, uh, angry passengers. <laughs> yeah, and that is a good point, Leah. So let's talk about that. What mm. if you are in a, a situation that is not safe? Mm. Would there still be a value of orienting yourself? I think, you. I mean, by changing perspective a little bit, maybe the feeling of not not being safe can reduce. I mean, not that it will go away, but maybe it becomes a little bit more balanced. Because sometimes you, you also get this very high arousal when you're in unsafe situations and they feel more unsafe than they actually need to be or are. So maybe it is also a question of bringing it down a little bit. Um, not all the way down <laughs> if you are actually in an action and um but maybe just a little bit more yeah less aroused i guess yeah maybe you can also focus on people that make you feel safe i mean you're not alone yeah you might see it during an action you might see the police uh and that might make you feel unsafe. And you might also see a big group of friends all around you. And that would be a factor in the opposite direction. And I like the theme. What I'm, what I'm thinking right now is how we want to be in the right state of arousal, first of all. Because let's say in our homes where we might be watching this, um, of course, look, it's a safe space or hopefully it's a safe space. Uh, and but, but in an action or even outside in traffic or, or in a social situation where something is demanded of you, we want, and it also said, yeah, it's uh, the sympathetic nervous system. It's not, not, not like it ever turns off. That would be very bad. Uh, it's always there kind of. And so it's this regulation of, of arousal and we want the right level of arousal for the right situation. And so I think rather than, so orienting yourself to the situation will not necessarily mean automatically that that feels more safe because you might actually be in an unsafe situation. And some situations require very fast actions. And that um, makes this kind of thing a little bit, hmm, maybe you don't have time for this. But if there is time for, for making a choice, and if you have to make a good choice, then it can be very dangerous to, to take a, a, a reactive choice. And orienting yourself first can really, be, can really help you make a good decision, for example, in, the, in an action, I would say. Um, but of course, there will be situations where there's not time for a conscious thing and you have to just act, act, act. But I think this, this high arousal, it makes you more tunnel visioned and it can lead to bad decisions sometimes. It can also be difficult to act now if you tend to freeze instead of fight or flight. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and freezing, I don't know, Marianne, have you read about vagal uh, theory or, and, yeah. How did you say freeze? Because that's a whole thing. Yeah, <laughs> a little bit. Yeah, yeah. And it's because I tend to freeze. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm yeah, more the yeah. person that goes like, um. <laughs> yeah. yeah, because up here, this is the modern way, like, mm. this. Uh, because that's also a, a sympathetic uh, response. And, and even if you go, Freeze is interesting because it's actually a mix of like fight or flight is somehow a healthy stress response because it activates you. It's, it might be a kind of a exaggerated thing. It might not be, 
but the but you're expressing the will to live kind of Mm. but some but it, let's say if you're in a helpless situation then stress can also lead to the freeze response which is this really high state of arousal but you're locked down so it's this weird mix of being uh unenergetic and not having any energy but but being in a really high state of arousal and it, of course it's horrible uh, but yeah it uh, these are the general like um big categories as well so interesting um, yeah, talking about actions, I guess the next point is also really relevant. Like if you uh, want to deal well with stress, stress, <laughs> you do very well to be recovered, like, and to come into the situation with as much resiliency as possible, like sleep and food and, and meeting the, the challenge with a group of friends or people, uh, is good stuff, right? Any um, any comments on this this part? Like, if we're thinking about individual factors that help you handle stress or or be relaxed during stress. I mean, uh, for me, it's it's also about movement, actually. No, I mean that you do some kind of I don't want to see, say physical exercise because it sounds as, you know, go for a run. <laughs> I don't necessarily mean that, but, yeah. but like go for a walk or just... Um, but I write activating the body. Yeah. 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 I also thought what was, yeah, I thought narrative. Um, I was just thinking like the story I'm telling myself, like if I'm going to an event, you know, many people, for many people, this might be relevant in a um, public speaking context. Uh, let's like literally, you know, facing the police or speaking in front of a group might arouse exactly the same response in you. Um, and both in terms of going to an action and public speaking, the story you're telling yourself about what is it that you're going into is very interesting mm. because um, like it might mean very different things for different people to be arrested. It might also mean very different things like what response somebody gives you to something that you present um, and telling a story where you are safe or yeah, does that make sense? I think, you know, it's this kind of mental talk uh, things. Yeah. If you guys have examples of, yeah. of any of these, please uh, pop in. Yeah, I think uh, it's also very much how you see other people. Like, um, if you, for example, give a talk in front of a big crowd, if you feel that they're intimidating or that that you are just one of them, you know, like or like they're like you're just a human being, they are just human beings. Um, they will like know how it feels to talk in front of a big crowd or be, to be nervous. And, you know, if you see yourself as one of them and them like equal to you, I think it's a lot less, fri less frightening, for example. Yeah. Because it also allows for mistakes to like be okay. And you don't have to perform as the superhuman being. You're just one human being amongst many hmm. I think that what also helps me is to ask this question when you know when I'm in a situation that I see as overly negative <laughs> or not great um to ask myself that question of what else is there that might be positive you know so that you sort of shift your your mind towards positive things so saying, okay, I acknowledge that this is difficult, but yeah, what what are the good things about this? You know, yeah. Mm. Yeah, good stuff. Right. Um. And also keeping curious, I guess somehow. No, sometimes it can be like really um, 
uh, a good thing to be like, oh, wow, uh, being curious about yourself and your own reaction. Like, what does this feel like? Getting, I mean, using the situation to get to know yourself better. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, wow. Uh, and these kinds of things highlighted here, um, you know, we're talking about activating the parasympathetic nervous system. And so let's talk about top down and bottom up. So in a more like what we already did, noticing your breathing, that, that might be a little bit top down because you're changing your awareness. But we're gonna do one thing down here uh, called, for example, the, the physiological sigh. If you change how you're breathing, that will change your physiology from the bottom up. So you're affecting your, your body and that will change how you feel up here. But what we're talking about right now up here with, uh, with these narratives and how, how we are consciously working with the situation this would be top-down um, examples of activating the parasympathetic nervous system. And both ways are great. Um, yeah. Um, the parasympathetic nervous system is very uh, affectable, or, or the autonomic nervous system, you are very affectable by also lights and sounds and the whole context number of people, like the amount of, of input to your senses. People have very different tolerances to, to the amount of, of, uh, of, of inputs. So that's also something to be aware of. And, and uh, from my life where the, like physiotherapy and, or maybe like, for example, a massage, the whole setting of having a nice light and calming music is part of it is part of the healing because you go directly into the parasympathetic nervous system, which is why, for example, it's a bit sad that, for example, dentists, which do something very healthy for you, mm. it's in a context of really sharp light in your eyes and horrible, horrible sounds. And, and that's very, uh, you know, it's obvious why people uh, uh, like a massage more than a dentist, just from this kind of physiology, right? these basic environmental factors. Yeah, it's, it's pretty self-explanatory. Um, what's more, what's really interesting is what kind of, what, how different people affect you. Because you might be going to work, for example, with a little bit of, of higher arousal than you might need. Uh, and that's something to think about. Yeah, moving on. So starting position is interesting. So if you want, when you're doing exercise to calm yourself down, if you can lie down, that's amazing. Like your whole body will literally just kind of, oh, rather than sitting up. Because as we sit like we are now, um, the whole postural system is active. Many muscles are engaged in, in being here and we are showing each other that we are socially engaged and so on, and lying down, closing the eyes is, is parasympathetic. And then on the note of the breath, with, without going into too much detail, the diaphragm, your, your breathing muscle, it receives uh, fibers, nerve fibers from both systems, which is why breathing is probably like, you know, if you want to talk about affecting your autonomic nervous system, the breath is just you cannot come around it. It will have to be part of it because it's, a, it's kind of the most clear place where those two systems meet each other. Yeah, I won't go into why, but, but the inhale is connected to the sympathetic nervous system, whereas the exhale is connected to the parasympathetic. And just to go straight to the kind of the explanatory power of this, if you're doing yoga, if you're doing uh, pranayama or breathing techniques, the ones that emphasize the inhale, for example, Wim's, Wim Hof's uh, powerful inhales. That would be a highly stimulating 
if, um, a method <clears throat> and it will also have great effects on you being a sympathetic exercise. But uh, we're into the parasympathetic exercises right now. So we want exercises that emphasize the exhale. And if you are caught in anxiety, what you really want to do is to exhale fully. That is more important than taking the deep breath because the deep inhale, as I'm writing here, <gasps> there is something like, it can increase your anxiety, actually. So if you try and get control of your breathing, then doing the deep inhale is actually very counterproductive. What you want to do is focus on the exhale when you're nervous. Fully exhale. And one, ex one exercise which we can finish on, which is called the physiological sigh, um, kind of mixes uh, two things. On the one hand, it does a double inhale. So we can just gently start to do this if you want to try it. Um, you breathe in normally. And then on top of that, without exhaling, you breathe in a little extra. So you feel a little more air inside. And then after that comes a long, slow exhale. And you can simply relax to let that happen. And you can repeat breathing in, adding a little bit of extra air on the second inhale and long, slow exhale. One more time, double inhale and long, slow exhale. So consider now if you would like to change position for example, if you would like to lie down for a moment, feel free uh, to, to continue lying down um, or adjust yourself uh, however else you want. And we'll just give a couple minutes uh, to do a number of these physiological sighs. By the way, if you're curious about that name, you can click the link in the doc uh, and you can read or, or listen more about it. So that little second bumper inhale, after your normal inhale, you take in a little extra air. That one has the effect of increasing the pressure slightly in your lungs and expanding thereby your alveoli, the little places where the oxygen, the exchange of, of, of blood gases happen. And the long, deep, smooth exhale calms you down as we've talked about. So you both get the oxygen you need and you get that parasympathetic stimulation. Or maybe I should call it the parasympathetic response. Stimulate sounds a bit the other way. Take your time. Feel free to take pauses, by the way. You don't have to just continue with this exercise uh, endlessly. So consider breathing normally. Consider uh, continuing as well. We'll just take another minute. Okay, so let's uh, call it for now. This exercise can be done uh, without lying down, obviously. You can do it in any situation, which is why it's really nice because that this, this thing, it could go directly into, uh, you know, an action or whatever. Um, I think it's a nice, nice exercise. I've been using it lately. Any comments from you guys? Uh, I think it was really... Wonderful. I feel much calmer. <laughs> yeah. It's working. Yay. <laughs>
Yeah, in general, I think it was again a really nice like session with uh, yeah a lot of inputs. And yeah, I'm happy. Used in a yeah in a setting where you don't need a lot. <laughs> Cool. Yeah, exactly. We want low friction for these healthy things, healthy behaviors. Mm -hmm. So we skip this little awareness thing where you can actually try and feel the effect of the inhale versus the exhale on your pulse uh, for time. We cut that out. So I hope this was an interesting uh, introduction to how to calm yourself down and a little bit of theory as well as a practical exercise or two. Yeah. Um, you can download the doc below in the text um and is there anything more before we head out thank you very much thank you